let's pray this morning. We have a number of people who are en route to Pearson right now. They are heading to Ghana. And so it's a quite a large group that's traveling today. And then a few of us are going to be following on Tuesday for the opening of a hospital that actually looking around, so many of you have been a part of making come, um, come to fruition. So we'll pray for them and pray for our morning together. Father, we're grateful to be able to gather together, um, grateful for who you are, our God of love who, who reaches out and brings us to you as we are and uh, brings us to one another. And so we ask that this morning our hearts would be um, with you, that our eyes would be on you, and that you would give us ears to hear what you want us to hear this morning. We pray for those um, who are not able to be with us this morning because they are unwell. We ask for your healing for them. You are the God who heals. And so we pray for that for them. And we pray, too, for our brothers and sisters who are traveling right now to Ghana from Canada, from the UK, and just from many other parts of the country itself. We ask that your hand of blessing would be on them as they travel, and that this uh, celebration would be one that celebrates you and who you are and what you have done in northern Ghana. We give you all of the glory for that. And so, Holy Spirit, come. Be our guide this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to be reading from 1 Corinthians 8. You can open your Bibles or your apps to that, and the words will be on screen behind me as well. Now, about food sacrifice to idols. We know that we all possess knowledge, but knowledge puffs up while love builds up. Those who think they know something do not yet know as they ought to know. But whoever loves God is known by God. So then, about eating food sacrificed to idols, we know that an idol is nothing at all in the world and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things came and for whom we live, And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. But not everyone possesses this knowledge. Some people are still so accustomed to idols that when they eat sacrificial food, they think of it as having been sacrificed to a god. And since their conscience is weak, it is defiled. But food does not bring us near to God. We are no worse if we do not eat and no better if we do. Be careful, however, that the exercise of your rights does not become a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone with a weak conscience sees you, with all your knowledge, eating at an idol's temple, won't that person be emboldened to eat what is sacrificed to idols? So this weak brother or sister, for whom Christ died, is destroyed by your knowledge. When you sin against them in this way and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, If what I eat causes my brother or sister to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again, so that I will not cause them to fall. So we're in a sermon series right now, Church 101, where we're looking at what it means to live as a community of people who are putting into practice the teachings of Jesus Christ. And Paul's letter to the early church at Corinth has been our guide in this. And we have been looking at how to apply the good news that Jesus is Lord to things like leadership, division in the church, and relationships, and sexuality, marriage, singleness. And now Paul writes about food sacrificed to idols, which I'm guessing is not a top of mind issue for many of us this morning. When we go to the grocery store, we're looking for gluten-free or sugar-free or dairy-free. Idol-free is not a label that we're really looking out for. And the whole discussion could seem a little bit irrelevant to us at first, but before we tune out, we do live in a secular culture where every day we have to make choices about what it looks like to live for Jesus. Do we join in the water cooler conversations that thrive on gossip? Do we go to that party, to that club? Do we take up that kind of meditation? Do we watch that new series on Netflix? Do we participate in a culture that idolizes consumption? Do we get involved in politics? And if yes, how? 
Do we stand apart? Do we blend in? To what degree do we accommodate? What happens when we don't see eye to eye on what it looks like to live for Jesus in these situations? What do we do then? And that's the relevance of this text today. How do we navigate differences of opinion as a church? Now, because food sacrificed idols is so far removed from us today, we're going to need to do a little bit of work to understand the context so that we can appreciate the wisdom here for us. Corinth was an ancient Greek city. It had been destroyed by Rome and then rebuilt. So it was this multicultural city, and it had lots of shrines and temples to all sorts of gods, Greek, Roman, Egyptian. It even had places for people to worship Caesar as Lord because the imperial cult was growing at that time. So if someone wanted to appease a god or get a special blessing, they would take a sacrifice to the appropriate temple. Usually that was an animal. Only part of the animal was actually consumed in the sacrifice, and so what happened to the rest of the meat was a question. It might be sent home with the family. They could eat it with uh, their family for a meal. It could be sold in the market at a reduced rate, and for some Corinthians, this was the only meat that they could ever hope to afford. Or it could be used to host a banquet in the temple dining room. Now, these banquets were a really important part of the Corinthian social life. Scholars point out that the temple dining rooms were like our restaurants today. They were the restaurants back then. They were places where groups of people could gather for a meal. They could visit socially, and a lot of business deals and relationships were maintained there. Even though this banquet was distinct from the sacrificial rite, the lines did often blur between the social and the religious at these events. Here's how historian and theologian N.T. Wright describes the temple banquets. There was a sense that in feasting at the God's table, you were really eating and drinking the God himself, taking his life to be your own life. And then the drink, the sense of casting off moral restraint, the girls and boys waiting around the back to do whatever you wanted in return for a little extra payment for the God. So the New Corinthian church was figuring out how to live for Jesus in a city that ran on these kinds of events. How did they engage in this very pagan world around them? Do they accommodate or do they stand apart? And one group of church members had decided it's okay to join in. They saw no problem buying idol meat or going to the temple dining rooms. After all, they weren't participating in the actual sacrifice. But another group in the church couldn't reconcile the practice with worshiping Jesus. They had just been freed from worshiping idols, freed from the fear that a god was angry with them, fear, freed from the need to buy another sacrifice that they couldn't afford, freed from the sexual confusion that came with those rites at the temple. And they couldn't separate out the eating at a banquet from the rest of the whole religious system. So they were confused and shocked at the sight of other Christians going and eating at these banquets. They would have wondered, had, had they misunderstood? Was it actually okay to worship Jesus along with other gods? And so Paul writes to help this community learn how to bring the gospel to bear in this situation. I find it so interesting what he doesn't do. He doesn't give them the rule that he so easily could have. You see, earlier on, The leaders of the church had gathered in Jerusalem, it was called the Jerusalem Council, to settle a difference of opinion that had risen then around circumcision. You can read about it in Acts 15. But the outcome of that council was a decision that no, circumcision was not necessary to be a Christian, but Christians should avoid sexual immorality and eating food sacrificed to idols. So why doesn't Paul just tell the Corinthians that? Why doesn't he just remind them of that situation and move on to the next question? That's a fun question for you to take to your small groups this week, but here's a start. Paul wants to teach the Corinthians how to approach differences of opinions. You see, if he gives them a rule to follow now, what happens the next time they see things differently? Well, then they're going to need another rule and then another. And pretty soon we have a religion of do's and don'ts instead of a vibrant relationship with Jesus and with one another. So with all of that background, let's look at chapter 8 again. 
Now, Paul's using a writing form that's pretty different from our Western way of thinking. As an English teacher, my husband Brad has to teach students to be competent in our standard forms of argument. And we begin with the thesis, the main point, and we have our supporting points, and then we end with the thesis, the main point. And that's how our logic works. But Paul's using a different form that puts the main point in the middle of the discussion. So think of it like an Oreo cookie. The main point is the filling, and the supporting points are the two chocolate wafers. And today, we're going to start with the filling, with the main point. It's found in verse 6, because it's going to be easier for us to follow Paul's logic. Now, for those of you who like to take notes, here's a preview of Paul's principles for navigating differences of opinion. Remember that Jesus is Lord. That's our main point. Then, choose love over being right, and choose love over getting your rights. So here we go, main point. Verse 6, Yet for us there is but one God the Father, from whom all things came and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. Paul's doing something pretty brilliant here. He's inserting Jesus into the most famous and important prayer of the ancient Israelites. And this prayer, called the Shema, came from Deuteronomy 6.4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And that prayer said daily was at once a proclamation and a reminder that the Israelites served and obeyed the one true God, the Lord of lords. And Paul's using this structure to show that Jesus is God, Jesus is Lord. The Lord our God, he says, there is but one God, the Father. The Lord is one. There is but one Lord, Jesus Christ. And this isn't just literary genius on display here. This is central to what Paul is saying about navigating differences of opinion. When we disagree with someone, this is our starting position. Jesus is Lord. So how does that make a difference? Well, let's listen to Jesus. When he was asked what the most important was, commandment was, in Matthew 22, This was his response. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Professor Scott McKnight calls this two-part commandment the Jesus Creed, and he's written a book with that title. He simplifies it down like this. Love God, love others. Jesus is Lord. This is the first check that the Corinthians, who were enjoying those good meals in the temple, needed. Were they going there because of their love for God? Or was it at all possible that it was the social and business connections that were motivating them? Were they serving Jesus, or were they serving themselves? And it was also the first check for the group that was frowning on this practice. Did they trust that Jesus is Lord? and they were forgiven and free? Or were they trusting things like rules, routines, rituals to manage their standing with God? And it's a good first check for all of us when we find ourselves disagreeing about the gospel life. Jesus is Lord. So am I serving Jesus, or am I serving myself here? Am I trusting in him, or am I trusting in someone or something else? That's Paul's main point. When faced with a difference of opinion, remember Jesus is Lord. Okay, now our next point, this first cookie wafer here. Jesus is Lord, so choose love over being right. Let's look back at verse 1. Now about food sacrifice to idols, we all know that, sorry, we know that we all possess knowledge. But knowledge puffs up while love builds up. Those who think they know something do not yet know as they ought to know. Knowledge was really important for the Corinthians. They respected intelligence and persuasive arguments. And one of the ways that they resolved differences was by outshining one another in what they know, who had the best grasp of the facts. And this is still a default way for many of us today. So the people who were eating in the temple dining rooms, they had a lot of good knowledge about theology. 
Perhaps they had been Christians longer. Perhaps they had more years of education. Either way, they had developed sound reasons for their opinion. They knew that idols weren't real gods. So they knew that there was really nothing to the idols. They were smoke and mirrors. And so they correctly reasoned that nothing actually happened to the meat that was then sacrificed to them. So it didn't make a bit of difference if a person ate that meat or not. And Paul highlights all of the ways that he agrees with them. He affirms their knowledge that there is only one God and the idols are nothing. He agrees that what we eat doesn't make us more or less right with God. That sounds like Jesus, doesn't it? Who said in Matthew 15 that it's not what goes into a a person's mouth that defiles them, but what comes out. So the feasting Corinthians are right on these points, Paul says. But being right isn't the most important concern in a disagreement. We can be right and still get things horribly wrong if we're not motivated by love. And Paul's concerned that this group was creating a real crisis of conscience for their fellow believers. He points out a couple of dangers of using our knowledge alone to settle differences of opinion. Knowledge on its own can be dangerous because it puffs up, it inflates people. We know how this works. When we feel like we have the upper hand in what we know, when we're confident that we're right, then our ego can start to swell and we might get a bit touchy if someone disagrees with us. Think of the last argument that you had with someone, maybe a friend, a family member, over something where you were just really convinced that they had their facts absolutely wrong and you had yours right. How did you react then? We tend to double down when we just know we're right, don't we? And it becomes that much harder to really listen to the other person. My husband, Brad, loves all things Boston, including movies that are set there. So recently, we watched the movie Good Will Hunting. And there's a scene in it where Will Hunting's best friend, Chucky, he's played by Ben Affleck, pretends to be a Harvard student to impress some girls. And it's absolutely painful to watch because it's so obvious that Chucky doesn't know what he's talking about. And meanwhile, Clark, who is a Harvard student, watches, sees what's going on, and he sees a chance to impress. And so he jumps in, and he's showing off his knowledge of all these facts and concepts. And he's right in what he knows. But it's equally painful to watch because it's just obvious he's being a jerk. In his arrogance, he's using his knowledge as a weapon to humiliate Chucky. I'm sure we've all run into a know-it-all Clark or perhaps been one ourselves. And this is a person who is 100% right in what they know and believe and 100% wrong in how they are behaving. Love doesn't work like that. Love doesn't tear people down or strain relationships. It builds them up. Theologian and pastor Greg Boyd explains that when we practice love, we are actually ascribing worth to another person, building them up. Instead of finding our value in what we know, we confer value on others when we love them. In love, we see them as someone who is precious to Jesus, so loved that he died for them, and we treat them the way he would. Knowledge on its own can be dangerous because it puffs us up. It's also dangerous because our knowledge is imperfect. Verse 2, Paul says, those who think they know something do not yet know as they ought to know. We are finite humans whose knowledge is always incomplete and growing. We see things through flawed lenses, and we need to have a real humility about our knowledge, leaving room to grow in our understanding. Paul's actually laying a foundation here for what's going to come in chapter 10. You see, Even though he agrees with all of the theological points that the Corinthians have raised, he also sees that they have missed a huge piece of the puzzle. Even though their knowledge of idols is accurate, it's incomplete. They're not taking into account the activity of evil forces in the world around them. Knowledge on its own won't help us resolve differences. Not only does it make us conceited and prone to wounding others, but this side of eternity, our knowledge will always be incomplete. Now, as an aside, this is not an excuse for us to be lazy with our facts or careless with the truth. The scripture repeatedly calls us to seek wisdom and understanding. Jesus Christ described himself as the way, the truth, and the life. 
We want to bring our very best knowledge to bear on these situations. But like the feasting Corinthians, we need to remember that our knowledge alone isn't enough or even the most important part here. And so when we differ from a brother or sister, we remind ourselves that Jesus is Lord and we choose love over being right. We can trust Jesus to look after the truth, to make it known if and when it needs to be. And so now for that other related uh, principle, the second Oreo wafer. Jesus is Lord, so we choose love over getting our rights. Look at verse 9. Be careful, however, that the exercise of your rights does not become a stumbling block to the weak. The knowing Corinthians had a clean conscience when it came to eating sacrificed meat in the temple dining rooms. They had it sorted out intellectually, and they had another argument for continuing the practice. It was their right. It was their right to eat meat. It was their right to eat where they wanted to and with whom they wanted to without a whole bunch of rules. Paul challenges them to reconsider this attitude in light of his main point that Jesus is Lord. Jesus, who laid down all of his rights, including his right to life as the innocent author of life itself. Jesus, who calls his disciples to take up their cross, to die to self, to follow him. Paul puts this in the severest of terms. If we insist on our right to do anything that we have a clear conscience about, like eating meat sacrificed to idols, without considering the negative impact on others, then we are actually destroying them and sinning against Jesus himself. Those are strong words. Are they too strong? Well, imagine I'm out with a friend who has experienced alcoholism in their family, and they ask over the meal that we have non-alcoholic drinks. That would not be the time for me to insist on my right to have a glass of wine with a meal. I mean, even the very idea that I would think of it in terms of rights shows that I've completely missed the whole point of our friendship. I want to care for and support my friend in their freedom, not thoughtlessly insist that one drink doesn't matter. It very well might to them and to their families. Entitlement has no place in our lives as people who follow a crucified Lord. The language of rights is not ours to use. The language of love is. So when we have differences of opinion, we remember Jesus is Lord, and we choose love over getting our rights. We don't need to fight for our rights. We can trust our Lord to look after us. So to recap, here's what we've learned from Paul today. When we differ in opinion, remember, Jesus is Lord, and his creed is love God, love others. So choose love instead of being right. Trust Jesus to look after the truth. And choose love over getting your rights. Trust Jesus to look after you. In Repenting of Religion, Greg Boyd puts it like this. There's nothing absolutely nothing that should ever displace the command to love as the first and foremost concern of the disciple. No doctrine, no ethical principle, no personal agenda, and no exceptions. So as we close, I wonder if we can try a couple of experiments this week. Two small steps of obedience to practice. First, look for opportunities to choose love over being right. So you might be in a disagreement with a friend or a spouse or a coworker, one where you just know you're right. But instead of pointing out all of the flaws in their argument and illuminating them with your knowledge, take a deep breath. Remember, Jesus is Lord. And in love, let go of being right and try listening instead. And second, look for small opportunities to choose love over getting your rights. Maybe you realize someone isn't giving you the credit or the respect you deserve. Maybe you're in line and someone pushes in front of you. Take a deep breath. Remember, Jesus is Lord. And in love, lay down your right to be first, your your right to be respected, your right to get the credit. And ask, what does love look like in that situation? Remember. Jesus is Lord, so choose love. Let's pray.
I'm going to pray from Ephesians here. We bow our knees before you, our Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth gets its name. And today, Father, I pray that according to the riches of your glory, we may be strengthened in our inner being through your spirit and that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith as we are rooted and grounded in love. I pray that we would have the strength to comprehend together with all of the saints what is the height and depth and length and breadth and to know the love of Jesus that surpasses knowledge that we may be filled with all the fullness of God. And now to you, who by the power who is at work within us is able to do abundantly more than all we ask or imagine, to you be glory now and forever through Christ Jesus. Amen. If you can stand, I'd like to say a blessing over you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace.